Hey everyone, it's Jane. I'm here to do another taster today. On Book Riot this week, there was an article about the Australian Penguin classic bindings. And so I thought I would bring out one of my penguins. I previously didn't know that these were an exciting <laughs> form of cover that you didn't get elsewhere. But she's right, they're fantastic. So we're going to have a look at this. This is a corker of a read inside. It was first published in 1932, so it's a bit older than some of the other books I've been talking about. But it is, it's is—it's—it's a fantastic read. It's a comic novel. It was originally written as a satire. The other thing I wanted to say is um, there was a Climber Stax video in, in the past week where she talks about not reading the forwards of books. If you do get this one, um, have a read, which I highly recommend. You have to read the forward because <laughs> the forward of this book uh, is a beautiful pretend dedicatory letter, which sets up quite a few running jokes throughout the text. So, uh, should you uh, get this, have a look at the forward as well before you jump into the story. I'm not going to read you the blurb today because the blurb on this one gives away a little bit more than I really want. I'm just going to jump straight into the text. So here we go. Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. The education bestowed on Flora Post by her parents had been expensive, athletic and prolonged. And when they died within a few weeks of one another during the annual epidemic of the influenza or Spanish plague, which occurred in her 20th year, she was discovered to possess every art and grace save that of earning her own living. Her father had always been spoken of as a wealthy man, but on his death his executors were disconcerted to find him a poor one. After death duties had been paid and the demands of creditors satisfied, the child was left with an income of £100 a year and no property. Flora inherited, however, from her father a strong will and from her mother a slender ankle. The one had not been impaired by always having her own way, nor the other by the violent athletic sports in which she had been compelled to take part. But she realised that neither was adequate as an equipment for earning her keep. She decided, therefore, to stay with a friend, a Mrs Smiling, at her house in Lambeth, until she could decide where to bestow herself and her, and her £100 a year. The death of her parents did not cause Flora much grief, for she had barely known them. They were addicted to travel and spent only a month or so of each year in England. Flora, from her tenth year, had passed her school holidays at the house of Mrs Smiling's mother, and when Mrs Smiling married, Flora spent them at her friend's house instead. It was therefore with the feelings of one who returns home that she entered the precincts of Lambeth upon a gloomy afternoon in February, a fortnight after her father's funeral. Mrs Smiling was fortunate in that she had inherited house property in Lambeth before the rents of the, in that district soared to ludicrous heights. Following the tide of fashion as it swung away from Mayfair to the other side of the river and the stone parapets bordering the Thames became, as a consequence, the sauntering ground of Argentinian women and their bull terriers. Her husband, she was a widow, had owned three houses in Lambeth which he had bestowed on her. One in Mouse Place, was the pleasantest of the three and faced with its shell fanlight, the changing Thames. Here, Mrs Smiling lived, while of the other two, one had been pulled down and the garage perpetrated upon its site, and the third, which was too small and inconvenient for any other purpose, had been made into the old diplomacy club. The white porcelain geraniums which hung in baskets from the little iron balconies of one mouse place did much to cheer Flora's spirits as her taxi stopped before its door. Turning from the taxi to the house, she saw that the door had already been opened by Mrs Smiling's butler Sneller, who was looking down upon her with dim approval. He was, she reflected, almost rudely like a tortoise, and she was glad her friend kept none as pets, or they might have suspected mockery. Mrs Smiling was awaiting her in the drawing room overlooking the river. She was a small Irish woman of 26 years with a fair complexion, large grey eyes and a little crooked nose. She had two interests in life. One was the imposing of reason and moderation into the bosom of some 15 gentlemen of birth and fortune who were madly in love with her and who had flown to such remote places as the Jean Song La 
Lake Mabula Mabula, and the Kwan Hattons because of her refusal to marry them. She wrote to them all once a week, and they, as her friends knew at their cost, for she was forever reading aloud long, boring bits from their letters, wrote to her. These gentlemen, because of the hard work they did in savage foreign parts and of their devotion to Mrs Smiling, were known collectively as Mary's Pioneers O, a quotation from the spirited poem by Walt Whitman. Mrs Smiling's second interest was her collection of brassieres and her search for a perfect one. She was reputed to have the largest and finest collection of these garments in the world. It was hoped that on her death it would be left to the nation. She was an authority on the cut, fit, colour, construction and proper functioning of brassieres and her friends had learned that her interest, even in moments of extreme emotional or physical distress, could be aroused and her composure restored by the hasty utterance of the phrase, I saw a brassiere today, Mary, that would have interested you. Mrs Smiling's character was firm and her tastes civilised. Her method of dealing with wayward human nature when it insisted on obtruding its grossness upon her scheme of life was short and effective. She pretended things were not so. And usually, after a time, they were not. Christian science is perhaps a larger organisation, but seldom so successful. Of course, if you encourage people to think they're messy, they will be messy, was one of Mrs Smiling's favourite maxims. In other words, nonsense, Flora. You imagine things. Yet, Mrs Smiling herself was not without the softer graces of imagination. Well, darling, said Mrs Smiling, and Flora, who was tall, bent and kissed her cheek, will you have tea or a cocktail? Flora said she would have tea. She folded her gloves and put her coat over the back of a chair and took the tea and a cinnamon wafer. Was the funeral... Awful, inquired Mrs Smiling. She knew that Mr Post, that large man who had been serious about games and contemptuous of the arts, was not regretted by his child. Nor was Mrs Post, who had wished people to live beautiful lives and yet be ladies and gentlemen. Flora replied that it had been horrid. She added that she was bound to say all the older relatives seemed to have enjoyed it no end. Did any of them ask you to go and live with them? I meant to warn you about that. Relatives are always wanting you to go and live with them, said Mrs Smiling. Oh, no. Remember, Mary, I have only £100 a year now, and I cannot play bridge. Bridge? What's that? inquired Mrs Smiling, glancing vaguely out of the window at the river. What curious ways people have of passing their time, to be sure. I think you are very fortunate, darling, to have got through all those dreadful years at school and college where you had to play all those games without getting to like them yourself. How did you manage it? Flora considered. Well, first of all, I used to stand quite still and stare at the trees and not think about anything. There were usually some trees about, for most games, you know. I played out in the open air and even in the winter the trees are still there. But I found that people would bump into me so I had to give up standing still and run like the others. I always ran after the ball because, after all, Mary, the ball is important in a game, isn't it? Until I found they didn't like me doing that because I never got near it or hit it or did it whatever it is that you're supposed to do with it. So then I ran away from it instead. But they didn't seem to like that either because apparently people in the audience wondered what I was doing out on the edge of the field or myself running away from the ball whenever I saw it coming near me. And then... A whole lot of them got to me one day after one of the games was over and told me I was no good. And the games mistress seemed quite worried and asked me if I really didn't care about lacrosse. That was the name of the game. And I said, no, I was afraid I didn't really. And she said it was a pity because my father was so keen. And what did I care about? So I said, well, I was not quite sure, but on the whole... I thought I liked having everything very tidy and calm all around me and not being bothered to do things and laughing at the kind of jokes that other people didn't think at all funny and going for country walks and not being asked to express opinions about things like love and isn't so-and-so peculiar. And so then she said, oh, well, didn't I think I could try to be a little less slack because of father? And I said, no, I was afraid I couldn't. And after that, she left me alone. 
but all the others still said I was no good. Mrs. Smiling nodded her approval, but she told Flora that she talked too much, and she added, Now, about this going to live with someone, of course, you can stay here as long as you like, darling, but I suppose you will want to take up some kind of work sometime, won't you, and earn enough to have a flat of your own? What kind of work? asked Flora, sitting upright and graceful in her chair. Well, organising work like I used to do. For Mrs Smiling had been an organiser for the LCC before she married Diamond Todd Smiling, the racketeer. Do not ask me what that is exactly, for I've forgotten. It's so long since I did any, but I'm sure you could do it. Or you might do journalism, or bookkeeping, or beekeeping. Flora shook her head. I'm afraid I couldn't do any of those things, Mary. Well, what then, darling? Now, Flora, don't be feeble. You know perfectly well that you will be miserable if you haven't got a job when all your friends have, and besides, £100 a year won't even keep you in stockings and fans. What will you live on? My relatives, replied Flora. Mrs Smiling gave her a shocked glance of inquiry, for... Though civilised in her tastes, she was strong-minded and a moral woman. Yes, Mary, re repeated Flora firmly. I'm only 19, but I've already observed that whereas there still lingers some absurd prejudice against living on one's friends, no limits are set either by society or by one's own conscience to the amount one may impose upon one's relatives. Uh, now, I am peculiarly, and I think if you could see some of them, you would agree that that is the correct word, rich in relatives. On both sides of the family, there is a bachelor cousin of fathers in Scotland, there's a sister of mothers in Worthing, and as if that weren't enough, she breeds dogs, and there's a female cousin of mothers who lives in Kensington. And there are also some distant cousins, connection of mothers, I believe, who live in Sussex. Sussex, mused Mrs Smith. I don't much like the sound of that. Do they live on a decaying farm? I'm afraid they do, confessed Flora reluctantly. However, I need not try them unless everything else fails. I propose to send a letter to the relatives I've mentioned explaining the situation and asking them if they are willing to give me a home in exchange for my beautiful eyes and a hundred pounds a year. Flora, how insane, cried Mrs Smiling. You must be mad. Why, you would die after the first week. You know that neither of us have ever been able to abide relatives. You must stay here with me and learn typing and shorthand and then you can be somebody's secretary and have a nice little flat of your own and, and we can have lovely parties. Mary, you know I hate parties. My idea of hell is a very large party in a cold room where everybody has to play hockey properly. But you, you put me off what I was going to say. When I have found a relative who's willing to have me, I shall take him or her in hand and alter his or her character and mode of living to suit my taste. And then, when it pleases me, I shall marry. Who, pray, demanded Mrs Smiling rudely. She was much perturbed. Somebody whom I will choose. So, that is a taste of Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. And we're just going to do a little, you know, glamour shot of the Three Stripe Penguin Classic. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.